So uh, Marcello Baldaccini is a uh, assistant professor in the Department of Decision and System Sciences of St. Joseph's University. His research interests interest span numerous topics in knowledge representation and reasoning applied to cybersecurity, trustworthiness, and robotics, and a number of other areas. He's known for, for influential work on the A-Prolog Diagnostic Reasoning System and currently works on cybersecurity and explainability, particularly based on answer set programming. So I'm very pleased that Marcelo agreed to give an invited talk and I'm going to hand the floor over to him and uh, possibly mute or uh, uh, stop talking. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, James. Um, thanks everybody, uh, everybody for being here. That's really cool that we actually have people in person. Uh, I'm, I'm from Philly, so it was easy for me. Just five, yeah, 10 minutes train ride. Um, and, um, and again, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to give a, an invited talk. It's a great honor. Uh, PADL was uh, uh, one of the very first conferences where I, um, I presented a paper many years ago. Um, and a lot of my work in, is in practical applications <clears throat> of declarative languages. Uh, so I, I've, I always feel very close to PADL. And um, <clears throat> when James and Simona asked me uh, to give a talk, I was, uh, you know, I was thinking of what the topic should be. And, uh, you know, given the focus on practical applications, um, I ended up um, deciding. Okay, that's better. Um, I ended up deciding, oh, by the way, can you guys hear me okay online if I'm here? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I ended up deciding for a reflection, a uh, reflection on uh, people and ideas that have particularly influenced my career. Um, and, you know, that's, that's cool for me, uh, but probably it wouldn't interest people much. Uh, but then I realized that those people, um, they have impacted my career uh, more or less at the same time where there, when there were transformations occurring. Uh, in our community. And so I, um, I decided to take us through sort of a reflection that connects both these ideas and people that influence me um, and link them to how our community has evolved over time. And then at the end of this reflection, I will point out a few uh, directions in which I, uh, I, I think we're going. Uh, I think we could go, we should go, and uh, I, where I think declarative languages uh, can still have a very important practical impact. Uh, so the first person uh, that really influenced my uh, research is Michael Gelfund. Those of you who know me uh, the most know that Michael was uh, uh, my PhD supervisor, so obviously he would influence my research. Uh, but uh, those of you who work in answer set programming or um, surrounding areas, uh, you probably also know that he has a uh, has and has had a huge impact on ASP, having co-created it with uh, Vladimir Lifshitz. Uh, so um, when I started working with Michael at Texas Tech, um, he, um, there was one thing, probably the very first thing that he uh, made sure I understood um, was that when you um, write programs, theories in ASP, um, you should follow a rigorous knowledge representation methodology. So I was coming in um, into the field from as a as a imperative programmer, hacker, uh, and somebody who had learned Prolog and you know would just sit down and just type up things uh, without particular rhyme or reason. Um, and uh, so the idea of using a precise KR, rigorous KR methodology was already kind of uh, new to me. Um, but, um, you know, that's that's what people do in the community, right? They tend, you know, the, the methodology can be somewhat different from uh, uh, team to team, group to group, research area, lab to research lab, to, but uh, there is a KR methodology. Um, what was new um, at that time, we're talking very early 2000s, actually 2000, year 2000 when I learned about this, um, was that Michael believed um, that ASP 
together with a couple of care with a precise care methodology, reverse care methodology, uh, were applicable, uh, viable for practical applications. Um, so that was um, a big deal. Uh, it was a big deal because we probably all have this tendency when we're faced with a practical, difficult problem uh, to sort of let go of the um, um, rigorousness of the representation and we tend to take shortcuts because, well, it needs to be fast because I'm concerned about scalability. Um, I mean, if you think about it, that's what programmers tend to do, right, all the time. Um, <clears throat> And so that was quite groundbreaking at the time. We didn't really have any practical applications of ASP at all. Uh, we had only toy problems. Um, and so uh, it was definitely a striking message, um, yet unproven at that time when he was uh, uh, talking about it. Um, and just to make sure that we're all on the same page since methodologies are somewhat different uh, throughout the community. Uh, here is uh, what I mean by rigorous care methodology that Michael was advocating. So in representing a domain, and I'm particularly focusing on uh, uh, dynamic domains, domains that evolve over time. Um, he would say, well, you first of all, you need to identify the objects of your domain. Then you need to identify the relations or fluence if you're talking about dynamic uh, domains. Uh, what are your actions next? And then once you have essentially created the um, uh, signature of your domain, uh, then you're going to start representing the effects of actions, direct and indirect, using some form of causal laws that can be in an action language or uh, could be directly encoded in ESP. Uh, however, uh, they should always follow the pattern. These rules that you write, even if you're encoding the ESP, they should always follow the pattern of causal laws. So far, so good. That's pretty uh, common. Uh, the next two items are... Uh, um, a little more peculiar. Uh, the first one is before you even start encoding anything in ASP, you should first formulate the problem using precise English statements. Um, these statements should, uh, first of all, follow the expression patterns of the causal laws that eventually you're going to use. Okay, so if you use state constraints and dynamic causal laws, those are the expression patterns that you should be using. Second, uh, you sh inside those uh, expressions, you should be using uh, the English phrases associated with fluence and actions. So if I have a fluent on top, meaning object A is on top of object B, uh, then, then that's the kind of phrase I should be using. I should not deviate from that. Uh, the result of all this is, uh, if you apply it strictly, is that you end up with an English description, uh, but a precise English description uh, of the domain, very, very mathematically precise. Um, that then you can uh, almost directly translate to ASP. <clears throat> you take every English statement and you encode the problem in such with the, you, you take that English statement, you encode it into an ASP rule um, in such a way, that was the second part of, second peculiar part of the methodology, um, in such a way that um, if you were to read that rule back into English, uh, without particular interpretation, just straightforward, then the English statement that you uh, obtain should match closely the starting point. Um, so the result of this is, well, you have uh, an English specification of the problem that's very detailed, uh, very precise. Uh, you have a corresponding ASP encoding that is elegant because it matches the English one, uh, readily understandable. Um, fully declarative, almost by definition. Um, and thanks to ASP's capabilities, let me make sure I'm in front of the camera, um, thanks to ASP's capabilities, it's also uh, directly executable, right? Which was one of the big deals back then when ASP was introduced or a few years later when we started having practical applications. Um, again, that was the methodology on, you know, textbooks that's kind of like what you're told to use all the time. Um, we didn't have practical applications of ASP back then, uh, nothing, nothing serious, and uh, it wasn't clear if this methodology would even work. We did know that some toy problems might get out of hand. Uh, you know, we had very rudimentary, um, well, looking at it from 
20, 20 years later, very rudimentary solvers. So problems might get out of, out of hand. Um, and we actually had the opportunity uh, almost right away when I joined the uh, lab uh, to put this idea of KR methodology, ASP, uh, viable for practical applications, uh, put it to the test uh, with this project that here I'm calling USA Advisor Project or USA Advisor System. Some other people know it as RCS or um, uh, RCS Space Shuttle uh, System. Uh, the idea was that uh, we were actually contracted by another subcontractor to develop his um, planning system. Later, it also became a diagnostic system uh, capable of, um, uh, let's talk about the planning system, uh, capable of um, uh, taking an input, a particular maneuver the shuttle should perform in orbit and returning uh, sets of uh, sequences of actions um, that would open and close valves uh, along the uh, pipeline that connects tanks, tanks uh, to uh, jets so that eventually the right jets would fire and the shuttle would perform the required maneuver. All of this in the typical approach, the typical scenario was all of this in the presence of faults affecting the shuttle. So some valves might be leaking. Well, if you open those valves, fuel and oxidizer come in contact, they uh, naturally um, combust. And so they would have blown up the craft. So that was a big no. Um, and so this was a mission critical system. Um, and it was a comp and the, the RCS, the reaction control system of the shuttle was a complex system to represent. Um, we had some time constraints, time requirements. So, you know, practical application um, for sure. Um, and that's where we put to the test this idea of the KR methodology being viable for practical applications. Um, and um, I, you know, I have a few favorites in our theory uh, the theory that we developed for the space shuttle. Uh, favorite rules that showcase um, the KR methodology, uh, they showcase ASP's abilities, especially back then we would look all look at these rules and go, oh wow, that's cool. Um, um, and so this is definitely one of them, the rule that I'm showing on the screen now. So the first thing, talking since we're talking about KR methodology, the first thing that I want to point out is uh, the two line comment at the top um, is um, precise. Um, it, well, I didn't give you the list of fluence and actions, but you can trust me on that. Uh, uh, the expressions that we use, the phrases that we use, um, are close, uh, they, they leverage uh, the uh, phrase, the English phrases associated with fluence and actions. Uh, we are following the pattern of English pattern of uh, um, the causal laws, which is something that can directly see. And on top of that, if you compare the comment to the rule, uh, you will see that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, and obviously, the order of things may change a little bit uh, for readability. Uh, but that's it. So for instance, uh, look at the beginning. Tank node and one is pressurized by tank X. Well, that's the head of the, head of the rule. Uh, we're not mentioning explicitly time T, which was actually part of the methodology, not mentioning time step because that was unnecessary and distracting details. Uh, if it is connected by an open valve to no, by an open valve. So if it is connected, that was fluent. That's the expression, the phrase uh, that we associated with link. Uh, link was, let me see if I can have the laser pointer. Okay, there you go. Uh, link was not even a uh, fluent, it was a sta static relation. Uh, you can see here and there that we were indeed concerned about performance. Uh, so we did not use a time step whenever possible. And in this case, it made sense, obviously, uh, because these are definitely static relations. So um, the node is connected to another one by a valve, uh, an open valve, which is um, in this other uh, condition of the body. Um, <clears throat> and the valve is pressurized by tank X, uh, and that's expressed by the last two conditions. You have a tank X, um, R is a subsystem. This is something that we included later and we did an update uh, uh, comment, which was not good. Um, and, um, and that, and the node, node N2 is pressurized by X at that time step. So very close correspondence. Um, this rule had, so, 
some something noteworthy about this rule is uh, um, it was a recursive definition. You easily see that. Uh, recursive definitions were already a uh, big deal. Uh, ASP was one of the few languages in, in the family of competing languages that allowed for this kind of recursive definitions. And it was a recursive definition in the context of the state of a state constraint, right? The dynamic domain, the domain that evolves over time. Uh, so double complexity, um, all of this written using the precise KR methodology. Uh, a second rule that's also, in my mind, a nice example uh, is the one that you see here. It's another one. So again, talking about the care methodology, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through it carefully, but you will see that the comment and rule are very tightly connected. Uh, one is really just the ASP transcription, if you will, of the other. Um, <clears throat> it is yet another state constraints uh, of sorts. There's a slight, slight variation on that, which I will comment on. Um, it is a recursive definition once again. As you can see, values in the body of the rule, uh, values of float. Uh, this rule is about, uh, it describes the behavior of logical not gates. Um, and uh, we use this rule because there were electrical circuits in controlling these valves in the system, and uh, there might be faults affecting those, um, um, those electrical circuits that we needed to account for. So recursive rule, uh, it is within a state constraints. Uh, I will comment on that. Uh, but the even bigger deal um, on this rule, about this rule, is that uh, it's not a rule that we wrote for the uh, USA Advisor project. It's something we had written a little bit before, maybe six months before that, uh, before we started working on the RCS. Um, for another project, um, this was part of what we call the general theory of digital circuits. Uh, and it's from a paper uh, with the same title, General Theory of Digital Circuits in a prologue, um, where we were not even considering the RCS, we didn't know it existed. We were working on uh, modeling the dual circuits and their behavior. And so what's really remarkable about this in hindsight, well, maybe it was remarkable even for Michael, at least back then, but it didn't strike me as much, but now it does, um, is that this was a, an example, well, this rule was part of a module, module of digital circuits, uh, which we were able to lift uh, out of that earlier projects and almost directly without change embed into the RCA, uh, RCS uh, system. Uh, so it's a striking example in my mind of modularity, uh, which you know at that time we weren't really thinking about. Uh, you know, it took a few years before we started talking about modularity in ASP, but this shows that uh, you know, how forward-looking Michael was at that time and still is. Uh, so this is really, really striking. And one more thing that I want to point out is uh, one more indication that we were toying with some concepts that nowadays we think of a lot more, at least on the practical side. Uh, I call this a state constraint. It should be, uh, if you think about how logical uh, gates work. Uh, but you can see that there is a delay. Um, we were trying to model delays at some point. And back then, this is actually for the... Um, USA Advisor, we didn't need that. Uh, but when we were working on gates, uh, we were trying to model the idea of delay. And so you can see here that we were playing a little bit with this idea of time delay. And we were, in, with some confusion, trying to capture that in the context of transitions. So we were using, at the same time, time steps, both to denote um, time agnostic um, uh, points in the evolution of the domain, but also uh, wall clock time. So uh, some interesting attempt there um, may still, you know, it may still work in uh, in limited cases. Nowadays, we people tend to take it a lot more seriously, but it's interesting that there was something like that. Um, but now the, the 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 important thing is, did it actually work? Uh, was this was uh, ASP and the care methodology? Um, capable of giving us a system that would scale for practical applications. And I have to say, we were somewhat surprised ourselves by how well it was working. Uh, you can see here, I, uh, this, this is a diagram that I actually copied and pasted from one of our first papers 
uh, Copa historically that was interesting to have it here. Uh, this is the time scale is in seconds. Um, for those who cannot see at the top, that's 14 seconds. Uh, so uh, all of the experiments on this particular chart uh, are within the end within 14 seconds. And there's actually a whole lot of them that that, that are a little harder to make uh, that are below two seconds or one second. In many cases, it was essentially instantaneous, even with the tools of that time. Uh, why is this important? Well, because the time limit that we were given was 20 minutes. And 20 minutes per instance, okay, per instance. And we were solving orders of magnitude faster. Uh, the reason why we were given 20 minutes is because typically, uh, expert flight controllers at NASA would take about that time to solve one of those problems. And so our system was orders of magnitude faster than the experts that it was supposed to help, that it was expected to help. So definitely it was um, working well for the practical application that it was supposed to solve. Uh, incidentally, just uh, four or five years later with the newer uh, versions of our solvers, I was able to run this even faster uh, on my cell phone. Uh, so it was amazing how, you know, things, uh, the, how technology evolved and and yet uh, the methodology and the ESP uh, just, just naturally scaled. Okay, so this one was the first idea that really struck me, the use of methodology, rigorous methodology that was not in antithesis with performance. Uh, the second idea that really struck me, uh, really surprised me, was by Henry Kautz. Uh, when I uh, left Texas Tech for my PhD, I moved to Rochester, started working for Kodak Research Labs, and Henry was my uh, supervisor. And uh, uh, his idea, I'll talk about his idea, and then I'll explain the context. Um, what, you know, in one meeting he said, well, why don't we consider um, hybridizing uh, different kinds of declarative languages. Uh, one of them would be ASP. Um, it, and I believe that if we do that, this is going to allow us to solve some practical applications that right now we're struggling with. Um, now, this is, let me, let me talk about why we were talking about this first, and then I'll put this in perspective. So the um, problem we were working on um, was a codec problem. Um, you know, it's a, a, back then, Kodak was trying to rebrand itself as a printing company. Um, and so we had this problem, which nowadays we would call a planning while well scheduling problem. Uh, so um, we had a, a set of orders in input, uh, orders for a print shop, so print jobs, imagine books, magazines, and so on. Um, and we needed to design a system that would be able to figure out which devices to use to execute those print jobs. So presses, cutters to cut the pages, binders to bind them together. Uh, how to configure them. There's lots of different parameters, uh, you know, page size and so on, uh, in order to minimize waste, in particular paper waste, which is a big driver of uh, costs. Uh, but then another side of this problem was um, yeah, the system also needs to figure out the optimal schedule for producing all this based on the decisions that have been made. Um, and uh, an additional complication was, well, we were really trying to deploy this in actual print shops. And what happened frequently in print shops was that uh, somebody, some important customer would come in with a, what they call a rush job. Uh, they needed this done for yesterday uh, and very cheap. Uh, or maybe they would also be ready to spend more, but still for yesterday, that was the key thing. Um, how do you how do you produce that rush job so quickly without disrupting too much uh, the current process? Maybe you're already printing something. You cannot just stop it. These are big uh, physical devices. There, you know, you can't just uh, reconfigure them on the fly. Um, and second, uh, things could also break. Uh, if a press broke, then things needed to be shifted. Um, and again, we're talking about large device, large physical devices, large physical objects, big pages, right? You can not just, uh, it's not a piece of paper that I just moved from one printer to another. Um, <clears throat> so these revisions 
on the fly uh, were complicated. Uh, in print shops, there were uh, uh, specific people who were very highly paid. They had substantial expert knowledge and they would be able to quickly uh, revise the entire print shop plan and schedule uh, for these uh, sudden changes. Um, the idea was uh, the changes needed to be incremental. You couldn't just disrupt the entire plan and the entire schedule. You needed to keep as much as possible of what was already there, but change it in such a smart way that you could accommodate for whatever had happened <clears throat> or whatever rush orders you had and minimize waste and minimize costs. Uh, so these people were really highly paid, highly, highly paid. And uh, the, the experienced ones, the new ones on the job, uh, they didn't have the experience, they would struggle. And so the idea was, uh, Kodak had the idea of creating this system that would act as a decision support system for the newer people in order to help them all, uh, rock along while they gained experience. And I suspect under the hood, the final, uh, given that they were so highly paid when they were experts, I guess the under the hood, the, the, the idea was that eventually they would be replaced, but that's something that was beyond our uh, concerns. Um, <clears throat> okay, so given this problem, so I, that was a problem that was assigned to me. I started looking at it. Um, at first I thought, hey, it looks like a planning problem. I could use ASP, that would be fun. Um, I tried, uh, miserably failed uh, as soon as I started dealing with numbers and costs and minimizations. Um, and uh, then I, somebody pointed me to constraint programming. Sounded like a great idea for the scheduling part. Uh, I started using it and I uh, really struggled with the declarative aspects. Um, I mean, the, the numerical constraints I could set up. I loved setting them up. It was enjoyable. Uh, but there was a substantial logical uh, framework in this problem that... Uh, you know, you, that I needed to, I couldn't encode with constraints directly. I mean, I could have. In hindsight, we know that I could have. But I don't know how pleasantly. Um, but I was using the host language for, um, and the host language was Prolog. I tried that. It didn't quite work too well. Uh, I even tried C++, another host language for the uh, constraint programming system we were using. Uh, really, really was cumbersome. Um, and so that's when, in discussions with uh, Henry, he said, well, you know, uh, there's the SMT people. They are combining uh, a logical language with a constraint declarative language. Uh, things are going pretty well there. Uh, you should consider something like that. Um, and uh, what was interesting when he, you know, you can should consider something like that didn't just mean, hey, why don't you play with this for a toy problem? The idea was, well, if you take ASP and you combine it with a constraint programming language, uh, whatever you obtain should be viable for a practical application. So we are talking about a formalism that almost didn't exist yet. Um, I'll say something in a second. Uh, and we're talking about some supporting solver that basically didn't exist yet. And the bet was this is gonna work for practical applications. So huge insights, insight. Um, in hindsight, well, we know that it works well for at least for several applications. What nowadays we call constraint ASP works great, right? Very fast, much better than just the ASP, uh, much more convenient uh, than just uh, the numerical counterparts in constraint programming. Uh, but the, but there was a big gap between where we were and where we needed to be. Uh, so historically speaking, more or less at that time, I was actually looking at the dates uh, as I was uh, preparing this, um, maybe six months before uh, Basilic, Bonatti, and Gelfund, Michael Gelfund again, um, they had proposed indeed an approach for combining ASP and constraint programming. Uh, there was a paper. Uh, this paper was, um, you know, one of our papers, mostly theoretical, talking about the algorithm, talking about the properties, uh, showing some toy problems. Um, I mean, a, a cool, regular uh, ASP or PDL even paper, um, definitely nothing that showed uh, how this would scale. Um, and definitely there was no system attached. Um, more or less at the time, actually maybe a little bit later, uh, when we, when Harry and I started talking about this, uh, Vina Mellercote, who was, had been my uh, colleague in uh, Michael's lab, 
and Michael and Yuanlin Zhang, Zhang uh, they um, actually started working on a prototype of a solver. Um, I tried it, I tried the very early prototype that I had that Vina gave me access to. Um, it, it worked, but it was a proof of concept. Uh, so as soon as I applied it to very small problem instances in our, con in our for our problem, it didn't scale. Um, and so, so we had an idea. We had this idea that, yes, it's going to work for constraint ASP, it's going to work for industrial applications, but we didn't know if it was going to work or not for real. Um, <clears throat> and so after a few months of discussions and work and research, uh, also on how things have been done, on the SMT side, um, we ended up with this system, uh, and I think of it as a system because it was really, I was really, really focused on the applied side, on the practical side of system side, more than on theory. Um, this system that we called Easy CSP, and the EZ stands really for easy. Some people sometimes ask me, what's that easy for? It's really for easy. Uh, this came from my frustration in attempting to build the system earlier with just CSP. Um, and struggling with the host languages, I couldn't find one that was a nice fit. And as I was looking at them, I was like, oh, if I could only describe this print shop using ASP, it would be so convenient. If it only scale, it scaled. And so that's why the easy. Uh, so my idea was ASP is going to act as a host language uh, for the constraint programming uh, component. And uh, uh, as a host language, um, it's going to give us uh, allow us to describe the logical links within this print shop. It's going to allow us to handle the planning part. Um, and also, very important, uh, somewhere here on the slide, I can't tell where I put it, but it should be there. Uh, very important, the, uh, it's going to allow us, help us at least, capture the expert knowledge. See, in my mind, um, given the examples of expert knowledge that we got from some people in print shops, uh, all that expert knowledge was going to be um, heavily defeasible. Um, yeah, normally you do it this way, but there are some exceptions. Here is one. When when things are this way, I do it differently, right? So it was your traditional common sense knowledge. Uh, so ASP was going to help us capture that very nicely, uh, very conveniently. And then the constraint programming um, component was going to help us uh, handle the uh, scheduling side of things. Um, Again, because this would so this was actually a solver of sorts. It was really lightweight coordination layer between uh, existing solvers, ASP and constraint solvers. And um, um, the challenge was I didn't know which. I mean, I, we basically only had um, uh, LPARS and S models back then as uh, practical solvers. Um, Klingo was was almost there, but not quite. Um, on the constraint solver, I wasn't quite sure which solver, which type of solver I needed. I didn't even know exactly which kinds of uh, variable domains I needed. Uh, finite domains, reals, it wasn't entirely clear. Um, there was flexibility um, on one side and there were, as, you, as I said before, performance needs on the other. And so um, this idea of a lightweight layer uh, that um, used the loosely coupled architecture, um, allowed us to use the solvers without modifications. So we could bring in a new solver in, back then was probably half a day, um, you know, just building the interface around it uh, without modifying it at all. And that allowed us to experiment with a number of combinations of solvers and configurations, uh, something that was not, would have not been possible, for instance, with the uh, system that Vina was working on, uh, which was a title coupled system. You would need to actually modify the, the underlying solvers. And so through this, we got to a, identifying a combination of uh, uh, solvers and configurations that work well, that scaled well, that, that promised to scale well. Um, and then we started applying it. Um, and uh, we actually deployed the system. Uh, so if you think about the, the history of this, of the system, it started from, well, you know, why don't we consider combining ASP with uh, another numerically focused declarative language? Uh, not only that combines the best of both worlds, but I think that's gonna give us good performance and it's gonna have practical applicability. 
Uh, and from that, we got all the way to an actually deployed system. Uh, so for EasyCSP, at least as a uh, constraint ASP system, EasyCSP came out together with its first deployed application, which was which is probably quite unusual. Um, deployed so much that it had it was within a an actual piece of software with a professional design user interface. So it was really cool and it was capable of these incremental uh, modifications to plan and schedule. Um, and they could capture whatever kind of expert knowledge we were given. Uh, so bottom line, the um, uh, uh, the idea clearly worked. Um, something I should mention or I should uh, stress is notice the idea was not the, the novelty of the idea was not, hey, we can combine declarative languages. Again, that we knew, SMT people have been working on that. Uh, the novelty of the idea was, and it wasn't even we can combine ASP with something else because Michael and others had been working on that a little bit before, uh, but the novelty was this thing is actually gonna be usable in practice. And that was indeed the case and it was quite striking. Um, <clears throat> okay, then third idea. Um, oh, and by the way, in terms of milestones so far, so what we've seen is uh, Michael's idea coincides with a milestone in our community where we started actually creating systems, practically usable systems using our techniques, uh, especially ESP. That's, you know, when I think in terms of our community, my focus is typically ESP. Um, Second milestone, well, we found some issues, you know, we cannot push the envelope too much with just ASP uh, sometimes, um, but we can combine uh, ASP with other systems. And that's where the community more or less at the time started uh, getting concerned with. Um, and, and, and the idea uh, coincided, corresponds to that milestone, uh, Henry's idea. And then there's this third idea. Uh, so a few years ago, two and a half, almost three years ago, um, I uh, started working with Dave Ferrucci. Uh, his, uh, you guys probably remember him from the IBM Watson system. He was the creator of the IBM Watson system that won Jeopardy. And um, um, uh, when I met him, one of the first things he explained to me uh, was that his view of intelligent agents uh, was that agents should be thought partners for humans. So far, so good, right? We, we kind of think along, uh, think along that, those lines, I think, all, all the time. Uh, they should collaborate with humans. Sure, that would be cool. That's, you know, it's a, if, if an agent is a decision support system, it's definitely collaborating with humans. Uh, but he, what was really striking about his uh, view was that um, uh, intelligent agents, uh, as thought partners, uh, don't necessarily act in a fully autonomous way. They, they don't necessarily solve all the problems that they're given. Sometimes they need to realize that, hey, this problem is just too hard for me. I don't have enough knowledge. I would need to consider too many options, or uh, I'm not sure about this knowledge I have. Maybe there's something strange in it, something that doesn't quite add up. Um, I should stop and talk to a human and have the human help me along, basically help me traverse some part of this uh, search space that would be too large for me, and then I can keep going. Um, so that was a really striking idea to me. Um, I always saw myself as somebody who worked on autonomous agents, fully, I, I believe I have some papers or presentations where I actually stress fully autonomous agents. Um, and so to me, at first I was like, no, that's not what I work on. <laughs> Um, and then as I started thinking about it, I found that it was fascinating and very close to the way humans collaborate with each other, right? Oh, I, I cannot know how, I don't know how to do this. Can you give me a, an extra hint? Um, <clears throat> and, um, and so that's when I uh, started working with Dave and uh, his company. So Dave now heads Elemental Cognition, EC. Um, and... Um, I mean, I'm not sure if he would say it this way, uh, but from my perspective of non-monotonic reasoning person, uh, EC is, uh, I describe it, like I say there, as IBM Watson meets non-monotonic reasoning. Uh, I mean, they did use non-monotonic reasoning in Watson. Uh, but, um, you know, lots of things were done in a relatively shallow way in Watson. Um, not surprisingly, right? It's a, it's a, it was a very difficult system to build. 
Uh, but um, it, what's interesting is at EC, there is a full acknowledgement that um, proper knowledge representation, deep knowledge representation, non-monotonic reason, declarative programming, they have a major role in building the intelligence systems or the thought partners of the future. Okay, and it's interesting that you know we're talking about this these things now. I'm not talking about early 2000s. So, you know, machine learning is all the rage. Uh, people are building all sorts of cool systems using machine learning. And here you have a company that does use uh, machine learning, uh, but recognizes the importance of all we are building as a community, which I think is very cool. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and so as I uh, work. Um, we did research more and more with Dave, and you see, um, we um, we came up, we came across a number of difficult problems. So EC, I should explain, um, is an AI technology company. That's how it's defined. Uh, they apply AI technology, bleeding edge AI technologies, to practical problems. And so we had a number of practical problems um, that we. Um, uh, tried to solve and tried to build products around. Uh, so as I was saying, the key, uh, the, the core concept around all of these concepts, all of these products is uh, the agent that's running it uh, is not fully autonomous. It should be able to talk to users. It's okay not to know something. You have to ask the user. And the flip side is you have to be uh, very transparent to the user in explaining why you got there, how you got to that point, what else you need, what your reasoning is. Um, and so uh, there are a number of capabilities that agents as top partners need, which at least personally in years, in my career before that, I had only, I had not focused on much. Um, an agent needs to understand uh, if a problem is too hard, so it needs to have introspective capabilities to understand that. Um, and it's fascinating if you think about it of how do you marry understanding of the complexity of the problem, which in part is related to how the solver works, the underlying solver, uh, with a declarative description of the problem and declarative description of the reasoning mechanisms. Uh, it's actually fascinating, something that I don't have a, a clear answer to. Um, it requires explanatory capabilities, right? You need to talk to the user, explain what's going on, explain what your reasoning is, explain what you need. Uh, it requires interactive dialoguing, um, which is something, this interactive dialoguing is probably the part where we are uh, most, we've all, everybody in AI has probably been very much aware of, um, of the need for this uh, all along. Um, Something even more striking to me as I worked with the, with EC and with Dave is um, even our basic representation capabilities, representation techniques, are really put to the test uh, once you start thinking in terms of agents as thought partners. Um, and so what I'm going to do here, starting from this idea of agents as thought partners, so I uh, want to give you an example of indeed a practical application uh, that we built at EC that uh, taught us important lessons on the representation side, on the declarative language side. This is uh, related from, to COVID, unfortunately. When I teach class, uh, my students, I tell them I, stay, I try to stay away from COVID as much as possible because we talk about it anyway. Uh, but this is just such an important milestone for, uh, for our work. Um, so um, Super Bowl uh, 2021, so almost exactly a year ago, uh, those of you who uh, follow the Super Bowl and football, uh, probably where? Well, uh, Super Bowl 2021 was actually made possible in part by an EC product. Um, there were uh, between 30,000 and 40,000 people working around the Super Bowl um, in the weeks and months leading to it uh, who needed to be um, control for COVID, right? We needed um, uh, contact tracing, we needed to check whether they satisfy the access policies. Uh, now, these access policies, as, as you know, especially back then, they changed all the time. It was really unclear what was going on and what needed to be done. Um, and so, um, a big, so this system was in charge of access control uh, for 30 to 40,000 people. <clears throat> so if you think about it, uh, 
access control in this context, it's really a state-based problem, right? You have the state of the user um, and properties, ultimately, whether you can go to your job site or not. Um, there was quickly evolving knowledge, observations coming in uh, about tests that users had taken, for instance, in particular, uh, but also updated, um, let me get a little bit closer since we have noise, uh, updated policies, they would change frequently. And so uh, this was a decision support system like the ones we had built several times. Um, uh, but there was more because it was built along these lines of a uh, agent as top partner. Uh, it needed to uh, be capable of um, interactively explaining to people why they could go to work, why they couldn't, give them a timeline of uh, when they can expect to go back to work and what they should do if they want to go back to work earlier or hope to go back to work earlier. So there was at least, uh, you know, many of these things are new from the perspective of working on agents as top partners. So um, uh, still, still, we are trying, we were trying to solve problems at a rather superficial level. But as you can see, at a superficial level, some of the elements of challenges that I showed you earlier. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go deeply into this, but I want to point out one example. As I was saying, even at the representational level, there are a number of challenges. I, I, you know, I, I have a tendency to think, you know, with ASP, with the action languages we have, with the hybrid languages we have, uh, we can represent a lot of interesting problems, probably most of them. And then I come across a statement like the one you see at the top. After international travel, one is not allowed access to the office for 14 days. A piece of an actual policy that we were uh, uh, modeling. Um, on the surface, well, that's easy. Um, I just need to say uh, access to the office for 14 days somehow, encode it in some way. But wait a second, so that's an actual number of days. So if I know that if I'm representing things in a state-based fashion, if I know that somebody traveled internationally on day X, then we're really talking about a number of days that I need to count down. Um, and uh, if a test occurs between that day X and day X plus 14, uh, that test, you know, PCR test or a um, you know, test positive, test negative to COVID and so on, uh, based on the policies that we had, uh, that quarantine period uh, might need to be extended or might be shortened. Uh, so 14 days was actually something that we need to, needed to work with. So how do you represent this sort of countdown timer in a way that you can actively reason about it? And we thought about all sorts of uh, techniques, uh, in particular, especially given my background on constraint ASP, I immediately thought, well, you know, uh, constraint ASP, there is action language H. Um, that was also something that came out uh, of uh, the Texas Tech Lab. Uh, Sandeep Chintabatina and Richard Watson especially worked on it. Allows us to deal with uh, fluence with continuous values. I can use something like that, but it's a complex language for what we're doing. Um, it's really for continuous values, not these just uh, uh, not sim simple interval um, uh, integer numbers. Um, and there were some limitations to the language that I wasn't sure would allow us to scale uh, properly. Uh, there was the idea of additive fluence. Uh, Vladimir Lifshitz, for instance, worked on that. I believe Yulia Lierler as well. Um, um, but with additive fluence, we could represent the decay, the fact that uh, the counter would decrease, but it wasn't clear how to trigger the fact that after those 14 days, uh, somebody could go back to work, how to do that in a relatively natural way. And so we ended up having to design our own kind of fluence, which we call time fluence. These are fluence with decay. And there was a way in the semantics of this fluence that allowed us to trigger change when the fluence reached a certain value. You can see an example for those of you who are here. I was standing right in front of it. But you can see an example of a theory using a toy theory uh, that captures that sentence describing such a fluent. And as you can see, it's essentially a combination of uh, uh, numerical fluence and logical fluence. Um, issue with all this, well, let me just uh, uh, 
move a little faster. Issue with all this, well, uh, now if you have 30 to 40,000 people in the system and, and the system needs to include all of them, you cannot think of them individually. And if you are pushing the timeline out to more than a year, okay, you need to be able to uh, create a timeline of more than a year. Uh, and your, uh, your, uh, uh, your time unit is in the order of hours, one hour. <laughs> um, then uh, those are a lot of time steps um, to actually model state transitions uh, continuously for all of these counters, all of these time fluids. Um, and so the representation that we chose was a sparse representation, in part uh, leveraging uh, uh, work that uh, Ray uh, Ryder had done and people working on action language age did, uh, where we only represented what we call relevant transitions. Uh, for instance, where that counter goes down to zero, that's a relevant transition before that. Nothing really is happening unless there's something else affecting the behavior of the system. Um, so we had this sparse representation of time steps. Um, additional problem? Well, um, <clears throat> this scaled for uh, middle, mid-size problems. Uh, the large size, large scale problems that we were facing, uh, we still, uh, we needed real time uh, performance. Uh, the user clicks something and it gets a re he gets a result and the system wasn't fast enough. And so we looked at incremental solving. Now, Solver Klingo that you guys probably know uh, is capable of incremental solving. Uh, it's used especially in planning. Uh, it works very well. Uh, you ground, you solve, uh, then you can add new rules. And these new rules are incrementally incorporated into the program, incrementally grounded. And then the, the answer sets are incrementally computed. So the search space is taken, extended incrementally, and explored incrementally. Very cool, very powerful. Um, but whatever new rules you add, you need to satisfy the module theorem. Module theorem, to go, without going into technical details, basically tells you you cannot add rules that allow you to derive existing fluence, uh, sorry, existing literals literals that are already in your program, derive them in new, in new ways. And in our case, we had a lot of cases where you would need to add a, uh, a set of rules for a new time step that you identified as relevant, and they're right between existing time steps. So there are relationships between the true values of the fluence in these time steps. Um, and so that would immediately uh, violate the module theorem. Um, and I suspect that this actually something that can happen frequently outside of planning. Planning is a nicely uh, laid out problem, but outside of it, this is gonna happen frequently. Uh, how we solved it, although I, I cannot claim that it's a general solution and never even published anything on this because of that, um, is uh, we rolled back our program. We removed rules in a way that Kling allows allowed us to actually roll back to a previous state. Um, and then we would add the new rules that violate the module theorem, and then we would build back up. Um, the bottom line, uh, there is a number of challenges uh, when, so the very thought of uh, agents as thought partners, even though on the surface, it seems like we're giving up power, right? It's like, well, but those agents are not gonna be as powerful as fully autonomous agents. Uh, it's actually a very interesting concept, very powerful, very difficult to implement. Uh, like I said, even at the level of representation languages and solvers, let alone the uh, higher level reasoning mechanisms. Um, so, uh, so that was the third idea, right? Um, and uh, it coincides with a, a milestone in our community where we're really starting to branch out, uh, looking at uh, more sophisticated reasoning mechanisms. We're not looking at planning and diagnostics by themselves anymore. Combinations of types of reasoning, uh, dialoguing, uh, explanatory reasoning. I mean, XAI is all over the place and in our community, we, uh, we, we work with it, we struggle with it uh, all, all the time. Um, <clears throat> so um, in conclusion, I, um, Basically, I, I hope you like this story. Um, this was a reflection on important steps in my career that just happened to coincide 
uh, with um, important milestones in our, in our community. And those steps, in my case, they were really influenced by uh, ideas that Michael Gelfand, Harry Collins, and Dave Ferrucci um, uh, told me, uh, communicated to me. Uh, uh, they struck me. I, I didn't get them at first. Uh, now I do. Uh, and uh, I think it's uh, it's interesting if you look at things in this perspective, um, the path all of this puts us on. Um, it's a path where, uh, in my pers in my in my opinion, uh, we really need to put a lot of effort on incremental computations. Um, they're very useful, fundamental for scalability in the big context of complex agents that we have nowadays. Um, and it, I cannot say that, it, that we as a community have looked at it uh, careful enough, especially from a practical perspective. Uh, introspection capabilities, that's also something that I think our agents will need more and more. Um, but that's, that's how, how you marry them with declarative uh, specifications. That's really interesting because it has to do with computation, but you want to talk about it declaratively. And then, of course, uh, explanatory reasoning. That's something that uh, we all know. This is probably the most trivial one of these uh, next steps. Uh, that's something that's really fundamental for the uh, progress and success of our community. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Um, do you guys have any questions? Great. Uh, thank you. Um, if, uh, if